Music Matters. Miss G. Lene, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? I am good. Thank you for coming on the show. Appreciate you, dude. Thank you for having me. Thank you for waiting over the long setup. <laughs> you know, like I always assumed like having a studio meant no setup, but there's still a setup. It's just a much more controlled environment. It's a very nice setup. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate it. I I'm proud of it. I think like, it's, it's come a long way because honestly, like when I look back at this, like, I don't know, just like this garage, I feel like if I had a time lapse of me like building all this stuff, I would have had no idea how it turned out, but it turned out like somewhat aesthetic, at least a little bit. I think it's an aesthetic. It's nice. Yeah. I don't know what it needs more of. Like, I feel like this wall, this wall definitely needs something else. You should just have like a bunch of photos of Lance, just like collage every <laughs> single photo of Lance just on this wall. In like different settings, different like settings. Lance in different outfits. <laughs> like <laughs> different settings as in his outfits. Yeah. Or imagine like the same picture of Lance, but keyed in like different colors. Like you have like, it's like red blue like andy green. warhol yeah, yeah like andy warhol but it just lands yeah <laughs> um you are okay so i've always we talked about this before but mm -hmm. you're somebody who like obviously like we're really good friends but it's like yeah. i always find it weird interviewing people who like are good friends of mine but i'm also like fans of their music obviously mm -hmm. but then it's like trying to balance the two but it's like for me i think with you anyway one thing i really feel like i kind of realized when i was kind of writing out some questions and researching this doohickey is that I don't really know like a lot of your story like I feel like I know you a lot as a person <laughs> yeah. but like not that much of like where you even like really come from like yeah. as a musician gotta keep it mysterious yeah <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> is it, do you try to keep anything mysterious that like part of your brand no right no I, I just like, I just feel like I just like don't I just don't share a lot why not just because I just don't I don't know like I just I don't really get asked and also like I don't I'm not the type of person where it's like yeah well I come from blah 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 I'm more just like yeah hi what's up do you feel like like the place because you're, you're from Florida yeah you're from what's the place in Florida you're called from I'm from West Palm Beach Florida from all my people 561 represent 561 yes yeah, 561 do you like I guess the, the the right way to ask this question wouldn't be do you take pride in that but is there like any notable things that come from the community that you're from um Ski Mask is from West Palm Beach. Oh. I believe. Also, Dominic Fights from Fike is from uh, Lake Worth, uh -huh. which is like right by West Palm Beach. A lot of like rappers are from West, like the SoundCloud era. Yeah. That oh. Was, oh, you, you're like there. So you're yeah. like, how close to you were like ex grew up? I, I think he grew up in West Palm Beach. Um, I don't know like how far away he was from me, but a lot of people didn't personally know him, but like knew him. And also, um, fuck, I think it's Kodak Black. Pump is from there. Pump is from the Kodak Black. Yeah, like all those people, like when I was in high school, like 2016, we they were like have house shows and stuff and people would go to their shows and stuff. Yeah, that's crazy. I guess because I never even like thought about because that I guess musically that is also what I know, like that part of Florida. Yeah, for. Exactly. it's like that 2016 SoundCloud era when you had like Pump and Ski mm -hmm. and you had like X and like, you know, you had like Smoke Perp and all those fools were yeah, like coming yeah. out of like that part of that part of Florida. Wi-Fi's funeral. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. So is that like the music you were listening to in high school? Was it mostly hip hop? A lot. Because I went to an art high school. So a lot of like the, the people that were there were like trying to be friends with all of these like soundcloud rappers so i did listen to that music i mean also like ski mask is a great artist uh -huh. so i did listen to that and x but i mean he's kind of controversial yeah, yeah. You, you said you said there were a lot of like house shows and stuff for that kind of music though? a lot of house shows a lot of like i guess i mean i never went to them because my mom would never let me <laughs> but um a lot of like in like these like these nightclubs i guess like i would always see these videos like a lot of my friends would go to them um and yeah was there like a music scene outside of that? Because the thing is, like, I wouldn't imagine, you know, if there were a music scene that you were in, like, no, literally, artistic wise, I wouldn't think that's like where it would be, like in in Florida. No, literally, like I, that was the thing was that when I first started making like music, because my friends were producers, they would use like FL, like Fruity Loops. Um, they were all doing like rap, and so yeah. I was like, oh, like I'll do like R and B type of thing, and that was like what I got into, but, um. I was more in, I was more in like the jazz scene actually funny enough in, even in Florida before you like before, went to Boston yeah well that was like my main thing was jazz I want I went to Berkeley for jazz voice uh-huh like solely and then now I'm here that's okay so that's so weird to me because it's like those are so many different worlds because I feel like yeah you know like <laughs> you grew up like you said like around all that hip-hop music in that 2016 soundcloud mm -hmm. wave which is like 
a, a like a very like influential period of like hip hop for me for sure and yeah. like w- part of the reason I fell in love with rap but mm-hmm. then it's like so you had that and then you're kind of coming from the jazz world yeah. but the music you ended up really making like early before like even the last the last two singles I feel like was totally way more R and B based yeah that was like what I thought I wanted to do uh huh and then I got bored of it and I just I don't know like I I felt boxed in in the R&B realm and I I feel like a lot of artists now like Steve Lacey like they're opening I mean he's always done it but like they're just opening more like paths in R&B but it's not it's like indie R&B I guess yeah but I don't know I'm I want to go back into that further on in in my career but like not right now you know yeah that's something that I was going to ask you about because that was like there's definitely like when you listen through your discography, mm-hmm. there's like a very clear like switch point, right? So you had like yeah. your first like four or five singles and then you had Michelle and Blocked. Yeah. And those are like way, way, way different. Crazy different. Did you, so you said you just got bored of those sounds or was it like a conscious decision? Did you kind of think it, you know, it in, from an industry lens, it was more brandable to kind of do that or? It, it wasn't even that. I mean, honestly, my producer at the time, he was very like, um, he came from like a kind of a punky sound and I, he would always listen to that type of music. Not always, but like I, I would always appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And then I realized during the pandemic, I was like, I don't like this. There's only, there's always like some, there's only so much I can do with R and B. And then that's when blocked was made when like we made, he made that like guitar loop, like the, and then I was like, wait, I want to make like an indie type of song mm. and then from there that's when i was like yeah no i don't want to do r&b anymore oh that's interesting so it was very much like a conscious conscious decision i think it was honestly subconscious oh okay because in my head like i will honestly like uh can i i'm thinking about like other artists should i like bring up other artists sure, that yeah. inspired me well like remy wolf uh-huh. i heard her sound and also like wallace spill tab and they all come from that jazz world too yeah they do and also like marinelli uh-huh. david he I remember I heard his production with like Spill Tap and I was like, whoa, like I want to do this. And that was something that I would tell my producer. And so we kind of went off of that sound, but I didn't want to rip it off because like I wanted to have my own originality. So that's something that I'm still trying to find. But yeah, this next EP that'll hopefully be out soon. Um, it's going to have more of like blocked Michelle vibes. Yeah. So more of that, like that kind of electronic pop lens. Yeah. That's interesting. I think like when you, when you, when you <coughs> talk about those artists, I think like, a lot of people who are listening to like pop music that's like very very mainstream right now don't fully realize how influential people like david marinelli and like solomon aphonic are like in the world of like underground pop music right now i don't even know if it's 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 not really underground but it's like it's just not like i feel like it's coming more towards the public yeah it was very much like indie now i feel like it's more like like everybody wants to do it now you know yeah i agree like that whole like you know remy wolf's a great example of that or like wallace like you brought up it's like these are sounds like I don't even, it's hard to describe because those two artists I just mentioned, right? Like Remy Wolf and Wallace, they don't make similar music, no. but it comes from like the same world. Exactly. If that makes sense. It's like pop music that like it's experimenting with both like electronic instrumentals and like different styles of production. That's yeah. like a bit boundary pushing in terms of like music that's trying to have mainstream appeal. Yeah. I mean, Jared Solomon Aphonics, um production, I was like in awe of. And He's I think, incredible. Yeah. I was like, I just turned 20 and I was like, damn, like I want to be making music like this. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like those like producers like that are really, really pushing the envelope in terms mm-hmm. of pop music. Yeah. But okay. So if the next EP is going to be more stuff like that, mm-hmm. are you, cause I guess I would ask you, so the world of jazz and I think the world of R and B, those collide a lot. Yeah. And I feel like a lot, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. You were the one who went to Berkeley. I didn't, but like, I, it seems like to me a lot of artists that come out of that world kind mm-hmm. of start in that R&B <clears throat> world, that R&B lens. Like yeah. those two genres of music tend to trend back and forth, I feel like, in yeah. terms of interest. So when you got, when you left Florida and you went mm-hmm. to school, what year was that? 2018. So you didn't have anything out at that point, like in yeah. terms of like actual stuff that you still have out now? Yeah. So, but that was all R&B stuff. Yeah, it was all R&B stuff. Well, yeah. Well, I should also say that before I did jazz, when I went to high school, it was all classical voice. So like I was singing opera and stuff. And then I went to jazz voice and then Berkeley. And then I made like one R and B song and then I was like, Oh, okay. So you've had like a couple different, like distinct, like musical periods. So when did you first actually start making music? Like when did you start with the operatic stuff? You said you went to an art high school, right? Yeah. I went to Dreyfus in West Palm beach, Florida. 
And that was when you got into like just putting stuff out in the first place? No, I got into putting stuff out like my senior year of high school, but like I didn't put it out. It was more just like uh-huh. I was making like demos with my friends. So none of it was like serious? None of it was serious. Like I was like, oh, like I'm going to release this, but like I didn't release it. When did you decide you were going to go to school for music? I always knew since I was a kid, I was like, I would always be like, I want to go to Juilliard. I want to go to Juilliard. Um, and then when I got into Dreyfus, which is an art high school, um, I was like, oh, I, I really want to go to an actual college of music. And that's when Berkeley, I was like, oh, Berkeley. Yeah. So you kind of made that decision like pretty soon after you got yeah. in high school. Yeah. Honestly, like when I was a freshman, I knew that I wanted to go to some music college. And then one of the seniors in my high school was going to Berkeley. And that's mm-hmm. how I discovered Berkeley. And then I was like, oh, yeah, that seems like it makes sense. Were you what was your actual <laughs> major in Berkeley? So I went through a lot of majors. I got in for voice Uh and I was originally wanted to, I originally wanted to go into music therapy. Um, and then the pandemic hit or not the pandemic hit my, 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 my vocal teacher at the time at Berkeley, she was like, you need to go into jazz voice. Like I understand you want to do music therapy, but like this school would be really helpful for your voice. So I was going into jazz voice and then the pandemic hit and then I was like, I'm going to go back to music therapy, did it. It was really difficult during the pandemic online. I failed a lot of classes and then I was like, okay, now I'm going to do production. And then I left Berkeley. Now I'm here. Was the plan when you were at Berkeley to like finish and do like uh, get a job in music therapy? Yeah, So the plan was never to put stuff out. It, or like, well, well, it well, I mean, like as a career, you yeah. Know, like, it was more just like I was like, well, if I put stuff out, like that's something I'll probably do. But like, I want to do music therapy. Like that's a good set plan. But now I'm like, I can't imagine myself doing that. What was like the jumping off point where you were like, you know what? No, I'm gonna fully pursue a career in music. Um, my first single that I ever released, like on Spotify, was like "Want You Bad." Mm-hmm. That song is so funny to me, <laughs> but <laughs> but. When I released that, that's when I was like, oh, maybe I just want to pursue just like my own artist career. And then the pandemic hit Mm. and I realized that in music therapy, you need to give a lot of yourself to these patients. And I couldn't give myself completely. And like, that's not fair to the patients that you're seeing. So I was like, no, I I think I'm I want to do pursue music completely Mm. or the music artist career path. That's always like a, like, that's interesting you say that. Cause I felt like I kind of went through like a similar like mindset mm-hmm. shift. Cause for a while I was like, all right, I'm gonna go to school for like music industry studies and get yeah. like a music industry job. Mm-hmm. I was like, I'll go like A&R or something. Yeah. But I feel like ideas like that mm-hmm. very often like exist because you're a bit too scared to actually go for what you want. Exactly. Cause you want to have like a, a, not a plan B, but it's like, oh, this is more comfortable. So I'm going to do this. And yeah. But yeah, a lot of times, a lot of people honestly have that story. Yeah, there's this quote I love from Jim Carrey where he's talking about um, like practicality, mm-hmm. and he's pretty much pretty much what he's saying is I'm trying to remember the exact wording of the quote. It's uh, so many of us choose our path based on fear disguised as practicality, and I yeah. think about that like often, often. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really true, especially like in the lens of like what I was talking about, what you were talking about. It's mm-hmm. like. You know, I, I, I could have, like, went to college and got, like, a music industry studies degree and then tried to go, like, work for a label or do a, be an A&R or a- anything like that. But mm-hmm. it's, like, I think if you if you listen to that, there's always, like, that voice in the back of your head that's, like, that's not actually what you want. Yeah, and, and also, like, I, my mom was fully, fully behind me all the time. Mm-hmm. But she, just because of the way she grew up, she was always like, you need a plan B, like you need to have a plan. So music therapy, I was like, I don't want to let my mom down. I want to make sure I have like a good Mm. career, I guess, you know, getting money. And then my mom realized like, I just, I'm not, that's not the career plan for me. And then, yeah, that's when I was like, I want to do, you know, my artistry. Was your mom like strict growing up? Like, do you grow up with strict parenting? I only grew up with my, well, yeah. Um, my mom wasn't like a strict parent where it's like, like abusive, but I, course, I mean, yeah. she's, she's Hispanic and she's very much just like, I grew up with that culture. Like traditionalism? She, very traditional. Yeah. That very makes sense. I would imagine like coming from that world, it's probably pretty scary to like, <laughs> see your daughter like pursuing music. How yeah. was, how did you kind of, I mean, when you dropped out of school, was that like a big shock? 
Um, for my family, I think it was because they, you know, they're immigrants and like they worked very hard for me to get an education and I totally got that and that was a lot of guilt for me. Like that yeah. was a big big issue for me like of me dropping out because I was like they did so much for me and I don't know like how am I gonna just let this all go and it was a big shock for my family at first and then that's when me and my mom kind of just like realized that not everybody's meant to go to school not not school but college and that was hard for her to accept but that was something that really mended our relationship even more Mm. not mended but it just made it stronger that's cool and the rest of my family just like they realize that I'm an adult and it's like, you can't control everything that I do and you can't live through me, you know? Mm. I feel like that's always like a sense. There's always like, you know, kids who drop out of school to pursue something artistic Mm -hmm. and their parents, you know, or have their, have their, their worries about it. There's always that, like that built up guilt within you. I I, kind of feel the same way. Cause you know, it's like on one hand, like I'm, I'm an adult. I need to live my life the way that I want and the way that I see Mm -hmm. fit and the way that I think, will make me happy mm-hmm. but on the other hand you have to understand that like your parents obviously you're going to feel some type of way about like whatever you do as well like your decisions do affect them but i guess it's just finding that balance like it's finding the balance between like doing what makes you happy and then doing what makes your parents happy but at the end of the day i think you just have you have to really do what you know is best for you and i think something that my mom realized um when i went back to school after the pandemic i was not doing well I was going through like a lot and that really scared my mom and she kind of realized how unhappy I was to be back because I was in LA during the pandemic. Oh yeah. Why were you in LA during the pandemic? I was staying with my producer and ex he's an ex-boyfriend, but I was staying Uh with him during the pandemic and we were just making a bunch of music. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. I cut you off. Where where were you going with that? What your mom realized? Oh, um, she just realized that I was really unhappy and she, realize that she needs to prioritize my mental health yeah. over over you know what society says you should do and and one thing that my family said when I was deciding to drop out of school they were like we're gonna love you either way and this is your life and we're here to back you up and this is your home base that's awesome yeah I I, I can relate to that I think I'm, I'm kind of wired similarly in the sense mm-hmm. that like if I'm waking up every single day and doing something that I don't think matters or something that I don't love yeah I, I get <clears throat> very like not well and yeah and just going back to school and just like i felt like i was going back to that's literally what one of my songs sorry is about i just Mm -hmm. felt like i was going back to stage one like because i was making all i made blogs i made michelle i released colors and i just felt like i was going back to stage one going back to school Mm, just because you didn't feel like was the curriculum that you were you know learning did you feel like it was helping your artistry no not really but what Berkeley gave me was the connections and the friendships and mm. I'm very thankful for that and I met my producer at the time and that helped me a lot as an artist so that I'm grateful for that but as far as the curriculum I didn't no yeah I feel that I think like I don't know like I, I've realized moving here and talking to tons of people who went to music school mm-hmm. that's a very reoccurring theme <laughs> very often people will say like oh like I don't really use what I learned, but I'm grateful for the connections. I'm grateful yeah. for what I, you know, I'm grateful for the the connections and the friendships I made. Mm-hmm. But outside of that, I didn't really get much. Yeah, and, and I think that I had to go to Berkeley to realize what I wanted to do. And I had to reach that really low point to realize that, oh, okay, I need to move back to L.A. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. When Okay, so the pandemic seems like it was a big, like, transitional period for you then, right? Yes. So during the pandemic, you weren't in school. You were in L.A. Mm -hmm. Was that the first time you were staying in L.A.? Um, yeah, permanently, yeah. I mean, so basically, like, the way that it happened in L.A., like, I was visiting my producer, um, and I was staying with him, and then the the pandemic was, like, oh, quarantining, and then I stayed. Oh, so you were were there while that happened? Yeah, it was 20, it was, like, March 2020 through, and then I went back home August 2020, so through Mm -hmm. that whole period, I was just with him. A whole summer. Whole summer, yeah, and then I was with my mom through uh, like late August through December. And then I asked her if I could live with my pr- my producer. And so I lived with him for like a year and then I went back to school. Oh, okay. So it was like a back and forth kind of thing mm-hmm. for a while. Yeah. Oh, I see. But I was, I was in LA for like eight months, 2021. Is that where like most of like the music that you have saved up and like had don't have uh, any yeah. unreleased music? Is that where most of it was made? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. So that's almost like a, like a, 
sustained period of just like working for yeah. the pandemic that was what the pandemic was for you it was and i'm very grateful for that time in my life because i wouldn't i wouldn't have made those songs so mm, yeah mm-hmm. are a lot of those songs in the ep you were just talking about yeah when it so give me like a lowdown with the, with the new ep um so it's five songs uh-huh. blocked and michelle included um i i'm we're figuring out a lot of stuff, but it's probably going to be coming out like in the next m- couple of months. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, cool. So there's like three new songs on it. Yeah, three new songs. Nice. So and, and this is all music that you said you wrote during the pandemic. Yeah. Is a lot of this music about like experience you had while you were in Boston? Hmm. No. No. One of the so- okay. So blocked is about. I feel like everybody knows what blocked is about. Michelle is about whatever. Sorry, I will say is about like going back to school and just uh-huh. being like, no, I don't want to go back. Um, and then the uh, the other song called Yeah Right is about just like this guy who was obsessed with me. And then the, the title track Shut Up and Listen is actually about my dad. So it's it's really just like everywhere what the EP is about. Oh, I like that title. Shut Up and Listen. Yeah. That's really cool. Keep it on the down low. Keep it on the deal. <laughs> no one's got to know. No one's got to know. Um, do you feel like when you were in, at music school, like one thing I've always wondered about, mm-hmm. like from an outside perspective is like, I feel like if I was in an environment with a, a lot of people who were trying to do like a very similar thing to mm-hmm. me, I wouldn't, I can't really tell if that would breed like a healthy competitiveness or would it breed like an environment where like everybody's comparing each other because you know like you have like a high school dynamic or whatever oh God, yeah. or like a regular college dynamic but like it was a high school dynamic. yeah i was gonna say like it's almost more like a high school dynamic because you're like oh i'm gonna do this after college i'm gonna do this after mm-hmm. college was that something that pushed you or did that, that make it harder for you to put stuff out it it honestly didn't push me or like made me like want to hide it was more just like i just don't want to be here mm-hmm. <laughs> i just the people you know what I will say about the people at Berkeley, it's just so like fake. I don't know. Like, yeah. Everybody's a clout chaser, and I. That's so crazy to me. I, I I wouldn't think it would be like that. But there are really talented people. Like there are yeah. people that I'm like, wow, like this person is insane. But it's just like there's just so much like, I don't know. It's just so fake, and I just I I, I can't. So I just like would not leave my apartment. <laughs> really? So yeah. you weren't like you know you weren't like out socializing a lot. I mean like. I had a, I had shows when I went back to school, but I didn't really take time out of my day to like hang out with people just because mm-hmm. I just I just didn't want to. Do you feel like that environment translates to LA at all, or do you feel totally different about Honestly, it? Honestly, no, because when I came here, thankfully, like with Lance and you guys, like I feel like our friend group is so like we're so tight, yeah, and everybody's just so nice, and like I, it's completely different. It feels more like I don't know, original, I guess. I feel the same way. Uh, you know, I, I was pretty, like, I'd be interested to hear your take on this, but I was pretty fucking terrified to move to L.A. Because mm-hmm. I always felt like the person I am is very not L.A. L.A., yeah. Like, I don't think I'm, like, an L.A. person at <laughs> yeah. all. But, like, and that kind of scared me in a lot of ways. But I think I've learned really quickly that, like, this place is entirely who you surround yourself with. Exactly. And, I mean, thankfully, when I was living here with my producer, I had a, a, a friend group there as well. Mm-hmm. And, like, I felt very happy, you know, and so I was excited to come back and I was, I was scared though. Cause I was like, who's my friend group going to be? Because I'm not, I'm still friends with those people, but I'm not necessarily that close with them. And then when I, you know, I started hanging out with you guys, I was like, Oh, bet like this is good. You know, that's like the same way that I felt. Yeah. Cause I, I didn't know, like, I don't know though. Like part of me, like this is my sound weird, but there was like a, a weird masochistic, like self isolation part of me that was like totally fine moving here and be like, oh, I don't need anybody. <laughs> like I'll sit in the studio and work all day, 24 seven. I don't need any kind of interaction. You're like, in a lot of ways, I'm like the Joker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like if I did hang out with people, they probably wouldn't like understand me. You wouldn't get me. I'm literally the Joker. Like I'm a little different. Like, I'm just a little silly, fucking crazy. Uh, really not like Joker. the other guys. <laughs> <gasps> so yeah. when did you move back to LA? Like pretty, like pretty recently, like a couple, like like yeah. what, like a month or two before we did. Yeah, I moved. I moved to LA. <laughs> October fourth. I still remember the date. October oh, 4th. literally, like right before we did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's so funny how that aligned. Yeah. Well, when I literally remember, like, <clears throat> I wanted to like hang out with you guys, but I remember Lance was like moving in because i didn't really know lance that well but like yeah we're both managed under the same people 
um and yeah it was literally like i think you guys moved in like a week after i moved in yeah yeah have you felt like homesick at all because you, you you've been back once right yeah i i don't feel homesick i do miss my family though i yeah. miss them so much yeah of course what do you think was the hardest part about like adapting to la Hmm. I, I think the hardest part about adapting to LA is honestly, like I, I, I find, I've, I found it easy to adapt to LA. I think it's more just like, I have to make sure I'm not in my room and just like not in my mm. house 24 seven. I need to make sure I'm doing stuff, you know? Mm. Cause if you're staying at home, you're going to obviously go on social media and you're gonna be like, I'm not doing anything. What am I doing with my life? You yeah. Know? I guess it's just comparing myself to other people. Yeah, I, I but feel everybody that. everybody says that, you know? Well, yeah, but I think it's, it's, like, especially true when you live in L.A. Yeah. Like, I think, like, because it's, it's even less on social media then. It's even then it's, like, I'm comparing to myself, to people around me, just around me. And yeah. it's not even, and for me, it's always in, like, a, this person has done so much cool shit. Like, I've done nothing. And it's, like, <laughs> you can never, like, satisfy that part of you in mm -hmm. L.A. because someone's always better. Yeah, exactly. You know? And I think just something that, like, I had to realize it's just like everybody started at ground zero yeah. and everybody's at their own level. And it's like, I can't compare myself to this person. Cause like probably like, I don't know. And also like people may look so happy and like they're super successful, but they're also could be like super depressed, you know? Yeah. So it's just like, I it's need to like worry about myself at the end of the day. Oh yeah, exactly. Dude. I think that is something that like is r increasingly rare and something that like I want to push with like my platform for mm -hmm. sure is like <coughs> real conversations with people where they don't act like everything is okay. Cause it's not, Yeah. you know, like that's one thing that I hate. I hate, I hate, I hate so much. And you see it a lot here. It's like people who, you know, personally, and on social media, everything's all like, oh, like so awesome. But then it's like, you know, no, literally like I post on social media and I will literally be in bed and I'm like, I fucking hate my life right now. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> I'm OK, though, guys. But you know what I mean? It's just like you don't know, like, what the fuck's going on with people. So it's literally fine. Like, just worry about yourself. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think another thing I struggled with pretty quickly was like finding a routine here. Yeah. Like that was really hard for me it, in the beginning. I guess I will say that that was something I had to adapt to was making my own routine because i'm no longer in school and i have a job mm. and it's like i have to start being an adult you know like i gotta start creating my adult life did you not feel like that when you were in college because i don't know i never really went because I, I only went to community college but like i always felt like you know community college is like not it, 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 for the way I was doing it because it was online like mm -hmm. during the pandemic it wasn't even really school like I, I essentially was living the same life so like I never had that period of like adapting to being an adult I don't think until I really moved but that was actually like the easiest part for me for whatever reason I felt like I was, I was college pretty, no I just like moving, moving here yeah oh. I feel like I was pretty independent like as is so when I moved it wasn't that wasn't difficult for me do you feel like when you were at school, you still had like that structure that was provided for you via school and like yeah. you still kind of had that safety net. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I, I had these classes that I had to attend and yeah, I didn't attend a lot of them. <laughs> um, but I had these classes I had to attend. So it's like, Oh, like there is some sort of purpose with what's going on in my life right now, which is the classes. So, yeah. Yeah. With music. And like also a, gigs. Too. Yeah. With music on like a day to day basis, is it hard for you to like fill those gaps? Um, it has been, but I'm slowly starting to get into a routine and I'm, I'm also trying to start producing. So uh -huh. I've just been, you know, learning how to produce and just like making hobbies for myself. And yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. I think the production thing would probably be like very beneficial. I, yeah. I think it's beneficial for any artist any to do artist. that. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily want to be like this huge producer, but I would like to know my way around you know, Ableton and uh, stuff. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, especially mm -hmm. when you're in, like, the studio with another producer mm -hmm. and you're trying to describe, like, what kind of palette you want to work with. If you can be like, oh, like, can you EQ that a little bit or, like, can you, yeah. like, compress that? Like, just knowing things like that, exactly. I feel like, would help. One thing I will say with my old producer, like, that was something that I really learned about, you know, working with people is that, like, I just really would watch him do stuff to my vocals and, and also his process of, like, you know doing stuff on Ableton. Mm -hmm. And that's something that like, I always think about when I'm in sessions and, and like, I always think about, okay, like I want this, this, and this, because it is important for you to have your own, like, like you said, palette and to go from that or else the producer will walk all over you, especially if you're a woman. What do you mean by walk all over you? I don't know. It's just like the thing about like the, not, I don't want to say the industry, but just like sessions mm -hmm. with like a male producer, 
he, they just don't listen to you. They're just mm. like, it's just like this, like, I don't know. It's just, yeah. Like kind of just like trying to make the song for you and not trusting that yeah, you can make the song yourself. Yeah, they're not listening to you because yeah. you're, I don't want to say because you're a woman, but I, I mean, but yeah. Because you're, but very likely because yes. you're a woman. Yeah, yeah, because I'm a woman. I mean, one, one session that I had, I won't say when it was or anything, but one session that I did have one time, this dude like started producing a song and he just kept like, he just started making a beat and he didn't ask me once like do you like this do you like that <laughs> and then once he was done with the beat he's like all right you want to write on it and i was like like n like i don't this like this is not my sound you didn't yeah. ask me once like what i wanted so like that wasn't a session at all that was not a session this was me just sitting watching you fucking go on the computer the fuck that's so so bizarre i was so turned off i was like i hate this <laughs> so have there been other experiences like that or just that one because um, I, I don't know that that that's so it's fucking like disappointing to hear but it's like i totally could see that happening i mean i will say at berkeley a lot of misogyny with producers and also just the men that went there so yeah. i never really had sessions with people at berkeley because i just did not i didn't want to allow myself i didn't want to open those doors to maybe having more experiences like that so i just stayed to myself mm. and i I mean that that one session is something that will stick with me because I was like I do not ever want to be in that position again. So I just don't allow myself to be in that position. And that's really messed up because like then it imprints the idea in your head that like you know like I don't want to do this because maybe this is a product of me or maybe like I'm the cause of this. No, yeah, and like that's something that like when I started making music with people like when once I started moving here and I started having these sessions with mostly men. I was nervous because I was like, what if they think I'm like bad or like they're not listening to me? But mm. thankfully, like with my managers, like they have paired me with cool producers and I've, I've felt heard, which is so important. That's really cool. Yeah. Is that something that was like difficult for you in other scenarios? Like the idea of being in a room with a producer that you don't really know and yeah. then laying down vocals. Like, do you ever have that, that little voice in your head that's saying like, oh, they're judging me while I'm in oh, the booth yeah. or something? Yeah, because literally like before, before going to other producers, I just had one producer. So I yeah. was just like, shit, like, th like, I don't know how I'm going to be with these people, but so far it's been like cool. And I always like make friends with the producer. Even if we don't make a song, like I feel mm -hmm. comfortable because they open the environment to being comfortable and like not there's no like hierarchy you know yeah that's really sick i feel like that opens a lot of doors for you too because then you can work yeah. with anybody even if yeah. you don't know them per se or meet them in yeah. a natural way yeah i also think like it is often and i think a good, a good, a good comparison for this would be mm -hmm. like for example when i interview people mm -hmm. i don't think it's like it's never your job or the guest job to be interesting mm -hmm. it is my job to make them interesting yeah and I think, like, the second you forget that, you get arrogant. And you think that, like, people, you know, they, they have some weight. But in reality, you hold the weight. I mm -hmm. think the same holds true for a producer. Yeah. You know, if there's yeah. a producer that owns a studio, or even, like, an engineer, for that matter, mm -hmm. and they invite you into a studio, it's kind of their job to make you feel comfortable. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, honestly, period, yes. <laughs> yeah, I have nothing to say about that, but, yeah. Period. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, do you feel like those experiences have been different in L.A. specifically? Like, do you think the people in L.A. are more, like, open to just, like, other sounds or, like, you working with them? And I guess I would ask you, like, how different? Because you've lived in, you're 22 or 23? 22. You're 22. Mm -hmm. So being 22, I feel like it's pretty rare to have lived in, like, three different cities. And, like, yeah. you have. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like making music in all three of those have been really different? And if oh, so, in what ways? So different. I mean... When I was in Florida, it was all, like, rap, R&B. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to Berkeley, I was doing, like, jazz. I was ma mainly doing jazz and, like, R&B fusion. And then I came here, and then now I'm doing, like, indie pop, you know? Yeah. Just such a variety of different stuff. And definitely, like, a different phase of your career. Yeah. Very different. Do you feel like, at least, like, I mean, this is, uh, yeah, do you feel like where you are now? Mm -hmm. You're at a place where you have more traction than you did before, like when you were making R&B or when you were making jazz, or does this almost feel like a reset? No, I feel like I I don't necessarily have, like, traction, but I do ha feel like I have more of a stable, like, not platform, but just, like, a stable ground. Mm -hmm. Like, I have, I have ground. Like, I don't have, like, nothing. Like, there's something there, and I can work off of it, you know? Do you feel like there was a turning point when you started to build that? Blocked. When I made Blocked mm. and I posted a snippet on TikTok and then it like, it didn't blow up, but it did get a lot of traction and people started DMing me like, oh my God, when are you releasing this? And that's when I was like, oh, like. 
this new sound makes more this sense. This new sound makes yeah. more sense. And also colors, but I, I want to say blocked was more like when I was like, oh, shit. Okay. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. What kind of doors did like blocked open up for you? Um, Well, I did have people. I didn't have a manager at the time. Mm-hmm. And I had like different like labels like emailing me. And thankfully, I had like people who were in the industry that were like helping me with these meetings and stuff. Um, yeah, it was it was crazy. It was it was definitely eye opening for me. And I also once the song was out, I got on playlists and stuff. And that was like, whoa. Um, and then I got on the Zane Lowe or one of the one of his assistant. But he's also like on the radio show. He showed Zane my song. That's so- I and saw then, that clip on your Instagram. Yeah. yeah, and and I remember that day. Like, I was only my PJs with, and my producer was there too, and like we like got this like this DM. It was like, oh, you're gonna be on the Zayn Low show, and I was like, what? And like I remember when that happened. I was like, holy fucking shit. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. As a hopefully that'll happen soon again. Yeah. That manifesting. W- manifested. Oh yeah, <laughs> dude. Zayn Low is like, I am like number one Zayn Low fan of all time. Yeah. I think Zayn Low is like next to larry king i think he's the one of the best music interviews of all time yeah like he's literally the, the way that that man is able to hold conversations and formulate his thought mm-hmm. he is like single-handedly the biggest inspiration for everything that i do really so oh, yeah that's sick so like when I, when I saw that i was like no way because i didn't know that until like yesterday when i was looking through your instagram oh, really? writing down questions i was yeah. like what the fuck gabby was on zane low yeah i was like that's crazy yeah i was in shock <laughs> no i bet that's so so it was his assistant that showed him yeah i Jeremy, his name is Jeremy, uh-huh. um, because uh, Henry Henry Lyons. I don't know if Henry will ever see this, but he I met Henry. yeah he posted it on his story, and then uh, his Instagram name is Hook Deacon. But Jeremy, I think his name is Jeremy. I'm sorry if I'm getting your name wrong. Shout out to Jeremy. Shout out to Jeremy. Um, <laughs> Jeremy. Okay, Jeremy. sorry. Uh, yeah, he saw it on Henry's story, and then he like DM'd Henry or swiped up and was like, I can't stop listening to this. And then he showed Zane, and then they played it on the show. Wow. Yeah. It's just, like, really funny how that happened. <laughs> yeah, dude, he kind of put you on. Yeah. Shout That's out, crazy. Yeah. Shout out to Jeremy. Jeremy and Henry. So that was Blocked, and then Michelle was your next song after yeah. that, correct? Yeah. Do you feel like Michelle opened as many doors as Blocked? Because you said, okay, so you met your management through, through Blocked, right? I don't know when they discovered me, uh-huh. but I, I met them... I met, I'll just, I met Michael and like Brad, like at a show actually that I was playing with Lance. It was at Family Matters type <gasps> of thing. Yeah, it was. Oh I, my God. Yeah. So I saw, that's fucking crazy. Yeah. Cause so I saw you perform like. That was when I, I met everybody. I didn't, I didn't really know you were there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I didn't even remember. That's crazy. Cause that was like one of the first acts. And then. Now that I think about it though, I have a shirt with your name on it that I didn't even, cause I have the Family Affairs shirt cause I was at that show. I never got one of those shirts. Oh, low key. I feel like oh, I, you, you can have mine. I feel like, I feel like it's unfair that <laughs> I have it and you what don't. You performed. Yeah. That's fucking nuts. So I didn't know you were, oh my God. That's so yeah, crazy. Yeah. That's when like I met Michael and I met Brad before that, but that he was doing sound. And he scared the shit out of me. I was like, this guy's really scary. Scary mustache, man. But yeah, and then Lance was like, oh my God, like, love your music, man. Like, I'm playing too, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and yeah, that's when I met all of them. And then we kind of formed, like, an Instagram type of relationship. And then, yeah. That's so crazy to me. Yeah. Damn, I literally had no idea I was in that room with you. Yeah. That's so funny. So yeah. were you, at that time, you were living in LA. I was living in LA. I was really just about to, that was, like, a week before I left to go back home. Uh-huh. Or back to school. That was, um... It, it, what's the guy's name? I'm sorry, I forget. It, Eric, right? Eric, Eric. through that, right? Mm-hmm. How did you get in touch with them and get on that bill? Um, well, he reached out to me, uh-huh. um, I think like a month or like two months before that ever happened because he was like, I want to interview you. I'm starting like an interview thing. And we, it's funny, like that day, I remember we were in his car and he was interviewing me. And then he was like, Oh, also, like, I want to have this little like mini festival and I want you to play on the bill. And then that's how I got on the bill. He like asked me during that interview <laughs> like during the interview yeah during well like i think it was like after but yeah uh-huh. yeah it was, yeah that's so funny yeah so okay so when michelle came out what doors did that open for you so you said you so you got the family affairs show uh-huh. you got management mm-hmm. did you feel I mean, like management didn't come till like december oh okay yeah so i was not managed at uh-huh. all still yeah but you were you kind of had that you know like that, that notion on your own that you want to switch your sound kind of and move yeah. towards yeah okay so then do you feel like that was a big turning point equally to block or do you feel like it was more like a follow-up? Michelle was definitely a good follow-up. Mm-hmm. Um, it, 
wow i just zoned out <laughs> michelle was was it was more just like a study i think it was a study of like okay like she's still releasing music and it's still kind of in the same realm and mm. i think i don't really remember michelle didn't like blow up on tiktok but i did post about it and the people that were listening to blocked i think they were like waiting for the next release and i think it was a good kind of like stable okay this is the next part of like my sound I guess that's like where you really went right with block. I, at least mm -hmm. I would assume is like, because I guess like uh, two things you mentioned were like it went really crazy on TikTok. Mm -hmm. Then excuse me, and mm -hmm. then it also got playlisted. Bless so I, I've always said like I think like I mean I don't really know shit, but I've always thought that like in terms of music marketing, like those are the two new forms of like attention economy. Yeah. It's like TikTok and playlisting, and mm -hmm. then it's like once you really hit those two with one release, I feel like that's like where you know where you can things can really start to change for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, TikTok, I mean, I, I just kind of, like, I didn't take TikTok seriously at first, mm -hmm. and then I started to, like, realize, I was like, oh, this is kind of working for me. Yeah. So then I just, yeah, I really started milking TikTok. I gotta get back into it, but yeah. Milk that shit. Milk the fuck out of TikTok, <laughs> <laughs> Um, when you're, okay, so you put those two out, both are 2021, right? Yeah. And yeah. you didn't put anything out in 2022. No. Was that because you were working on the EP mostly or trying to get everything finished up? I got with management like at the beginning uh -huh. of, or at the end of December, literally, I think it was like right after Christmas. Um, and my management just, we kind of were figuring out what's the next step because mm -hmm. I didn't have a producer anymore. So it was more just like, what, what is, what is the next step? So it was just like, yeah. you know, booking sessions and um, kind of thinking like, what's the next, you know, platform that you're gonna release it on mm -hmm. like not platform but like distributor and yeah and then hopefully this year i'm i will be releasing the ep oh yeah <laughs> is that um because it's interesting like i feel like you certainly still have like garner an audience like from you know block to michelle like yeah. forward like mm -hmm. it's not like you lost your audience yeah was that ever a fear not putting anything yeah. out like because i would imagine it would yes. be i i mean i always have these moments where i'm like i'm not releasing anything people are gonna forget about me but um, I mean, I think that's just a fear for everybody. I yeah. And it's still a fear that I think about now, but I, I just need to kind of trust the process and just, you know, manifest that it'll carry on. Of course. I feel like anything you're doing, whether it be building a business or mm -hmm. making music or whatever, eventually at a certain point, you have to realize that you have to play the long game. Like if you really want to do something like this as a career, mm -hmm. which in reality is like one in a million, they get to do this as a full-time mm -hmm. living. You have to understand like, you need to put in years and years yeah. and years like it's not gonna be like a six month process yeah and i think you know one thing that <clears throat> one of my managers i don't remember like the exact quote that he's or not quote but he was just like we're not releasing this because we want the release to be perfect like it mm. needs this this ep like needs it deserves a good rollout plan and i'm so impatient and i'm like no we need to mm. release it now but yeah i mean it, it does and it, it it needs time so yeah i think that makes a lot more sense mm -hmm. i um this like, kind of relates but i was it's interesting i was watching like this podcast that mm -hmm. mr beast did the other day and he was talking about like actually youtube and shit and yeah. he was saying like, like but i i was kind of taking everything that he was saying and thinking about it through like oh like you know like this is you know from a music marketing lens this makes sense too but mm -hmm. one thing he said that kind of stuck with me was like it's better to put out one video a month and have it be an absolute like banger then put out like one video every week and have it be like a five out of 10. And I was yeah. like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And I think it makes as much sense from like a music lens, you know? Yeah. And, and, and you know, I, I feel like it really is such, like it depends who you're talking to. Cause some people are like, just keep releasing music and something will catch. Yeah, and, then and then there's, and then there's people who are like, you need to give it time. Like there's no need to rush. Like nobody's pressuring you. You don't have like, you know, yeah. Fire it's under your ass. Yeah. It's, <laughs> a, it's a hard, it's a hard balance. And I think, it even plays into stuff like, for example, like Monet. Like Monet had all this other music that he like had on on streaming services, and then he took it down and started fully new. And just because he started new, because his first song got a lot of traction, everything else got traction. Yeah. So I think that's a big part of it too. Yeah. It's like running with the highs and like forgetting the lows in a lot of ways. Yeah, and like that's something that I I kind of want to take down some of my old songs, but mm -hmm. I also have this like weird attachment. It's like, but that's kind of like where it started. But it, yeah, I mean Monet's whole look now like he, i don't i don't want to say he rebranded because i didn't know him before but his whole brand is just so cohesive and that's something that i want with this ep yeah no exactly jack is also a genius shout out to jack but yeah. no th 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 that's very very true i i i've admired that too and i think i have a similar problem to you because it's like i never want to it i don't know it, it's, it's a really weird balance because it's like mm -hmm. i don't want to forget 
you know, you, you don't want to feel like you're forgetting where you came from. Yeah, I don't want to be like, oh, now I'm the shit. You know? Yeah. It's like, no, it's more just like, I, it's like maybe it is a time to like not rebrand, but time to like, you know, you know, I don't know make sure everything is clean and polished yeah yeah exactly and like shit like that really is important but I, there I, also is beauty in like the the beginning you know like when you listen to mac demarco yeah you know like you can hear the like band. rock and roll radio yeah era. exactly and same with like tame and paul with kevin yeah. parker you hear the progression so it's just like that's, that's true I, and it's like that's something that i'm like well i like if i were to ever get big one day like i want people to hear that with my sound but i'm so, also yeah. like but i also want it to look clean mm -hmm. but there is beauty in like you know the imperfections yeah, exactly i think that and it's it's weird from a marketing perspective because i think you're right right i think like the whole like rust strategy of throwing out like a song a week like that works for some people but i feel like it works less often it doesn't feel it doesn't really feel uh original it feels more just like okay you have a label that's like pushing you to release yeah. all the time you know yeah. or not a label but you have a team and, and you know if it works for you good for you but it for me personally it's not my style and that's something i had to realize because i at first i was like i need to release like all the time it's like no you don't yeah chill bro <laughs> i i guess the question is though it's like how do you keep people's attention when you're not putting out music and i guess that's oh. like where social media comes in that's a whole different conversation that is such a thing that i am still trying to figure out um, yeah i think i just I, I just post on instagram and just post little snippets of songs or i post a little thing of me singing and i just hope that people are like, oh yeah, she's still here, or she's I, still alive. Yeah. She's still alive. Good for her. Um, yeah, I or, or I like I'll I'll post if like one of my songs has like a certain amount of streams. I'm like, oh my god, thank you guys. You know. Yeah. So just like keep it going. Like constant being but in it the is forefront. Hard. It is hard being like I I feel like an a uh, music artist and having to come up with more content and and staying relevant. That is something that is like oh. It's like oh, it's a little tough. Oh yeah. I think playing shows can help with that too. Shows do help with that, but. I mean, also with shows, it's like, I feel like some people just play shows to play shows and they're half-assed. Hmm. And I, I do have like some sort of a band here, but I want to have like a steady band before yeah. I keep just keep doing shows. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. I don't know though. I, I also feel like in the, you know, I, that like I, something I just said was that like the two main things I think that are really important in like the attention economy of 2023 is like. Economy. Uh, what you say? I said the economy. The economy. <laughs> but it is like TikTok and then like playlisting. Mm -hmm. Obviously, those are super important. But I think simultaneously, people are starting to devalue live shows. I really, really believe that. Because there's a lot of bands that I know that like fully have curated audiences from playing shows. I also think like that's something Lance has honestly gotten right. Like, I, I think like, like, just like playing shows. Like playing a lot of shows. Because mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. like, you know, he, he got his following through the internet, which I mean, your following came to the internet mostly is, mm -hmm. is what. It, what I gather. Yeah. But honestly. it's like, at that point, like, how do you turn those people who found you from the internet into like real, real, real fans? And uh, I think that comes from shows. That comes from shows. I think also I, I try to like, I don't want to respond to every single person who DMs me and I don't have like a flood of people DMing me, but I try to like keep a, like a relationship with some yeah. people just to show that like, oh, I'm not some like asshole. that's just going to ignore you because I got, you know, a certain amount of views <laughs> on my yeah. TikTok. Um, also back to the live shows, like I will say when I went back to school, I played so many live shows to just mm -hmm. keep the relevancy up. And that's something that helped me a lot. Yeah. I, and, and I also think like, it's how you make fans, you know, like so the yeah. thing is like, there's so dude, there's like probably a thousand kids like that I found on TikTok. Yeah. Like I, I found a crazy song that I love. Mm -hmm. I added their song to my playlist. And I never thought about it ever again, yeah. ever. But, yeah. then there, but there's people <laughs> who I've seen in concert who I wasn't aware of previously. And mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my God, this is insane. Yeah, and yeah. then that visual and the, you, it, it, it almost like it creates a core two. memory, mm -hmm. you know? And then it's like that you become a fan of them. Mm -hmm. Yes, very much. Which is very different. You played, um, so you, I know you played one show in LA cause I was there. Yeah. Have you played other shows in LA? Um, yeah, I actually played a show uh, when I first moved here. I played a show at, I'm forgetting the name, but I played a show at, oh, I forgot the name, but I played a show in LA and it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun and I had a great band and I met so many people and yeah. That wasn't the one that I was at, right? No, that was, were you at that one? I was the makeup music one. Oh, the make, that's what I was, mom, makeup music. You were there? Yeah. 
I I think we just like weren't friends. I don't think so. No, we weren't. I well, just I was there with Michael and Mario and Monet. Oh, period. Okay, well, yeah, that that yeah that show. Yeah, yeah. that lineup was also fucking nuts. Yes, <laughs> that it lineup was, was it crazy. Was and my my band like we only had like two rehearsals and then we played. And yeah, I, you guys were you guys killed it. You were yeah, sick. They all killed it. Do you want to like play more shows regularly in LA? I love playing shows. Like, yeah, I love it. I just need to have a like a concrete band and like, um, yeah, and also like, it. I mean, at least in Boston, like it mm-hmm. did pay well to play like a lot. Like it, yeah. it did pay a lot, not a lot, but it did help me pay certain stuff. You know? Yeah, and then you can start to like and also distribute it to my band members, uh-huh. which is important. Yeah, of course, and then you can start to kind of like suffice your income yeah. from like actual working with like. Yeah playing shows mm-hmm. and it's like the more shows you play the less you have to work which mm-hmm. means you can work on music more and it's just yeah. like it's that steady 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 pipeline yeah. um in terms of like 2023 i know you said like the you, you want to put that ep mm-hmm. out is there like any other main goals that like come to your head i think i just really want to i just really want to focus on this ep and just kind of like what would you say focus on what i just want to focus on this ep like okay, i just uh-huh. really want to make sure it's perfect yeah that's like my main focus right now um i think also just like having a healthy lifestyle and you know focusing on myself putting myself first staying fit healthy slay healthy fitness so slay slay. slay. so slay 2023 i'm literally gonna yeah exactly (laughs) um in terms of like last thing i really wanted to ask you Mm -hmm. was i think like even beyond the sound change and the stylistic mm-hmm. change with Blocked and Michelle opposed to your other music. Mm-hmm. I feel like, I mean, I don't know if this is wrong, if this is wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like there was even like more of like a, like a, an artwork change and like a look change. Like I feel like there's more colors and stuff oh, yeah. on the, on the last two singles. Is that like a direction you were going to go in on the EP more? Yeah. So we're still figuring it out. Um, that was what it was going to be. Uh-huh. Um, I, I just, I'm just changing constantly and constantly my ideas are like, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to do that. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Um, but I didn't have a manager at any of those, with any of those songs. So like I was doing my own cover art and that was like, what? Really? Mm-hmm. I you, did all those covers. You did the Michelle arts. cover? Yeah. The Michelle, the block, the colors. That cover's crazy. I love that cover. Yeah. Um, I was, ju- it was just only me. So I, that was what I was into at the time. So uh-huh. it might change. The CP might be completely different, but it, I think they will have elements of those visuals. I want to keep it cohesive, so, yeah. That's got to take a lot off your plate now that you have help and a team. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Yeah, I didn't have a manager until the end of 2021. And just, like, having a team and people to help, I would imagine yeah, that changes I mean, everything. Yeah, and then coming to L.A. and meeting all of you guys, like, I I feel like I have, like, a steady team. Not a team, but just, like, a, a family. Community. Yeah. Community. That's beautiful. Community. It's beautiful. Um, <laughs> Actual last question. Yeah. If you could tell, wow, you, this is so steady. You hear the raid? <laughs> you hear that? <laughs> Damn, it is pouring. Anyway, last thing I really wanted to ask yeah. you. If you could tell yourself, your future self in five years something right now, what would it be? Like if you could go Damn. five years in the for, in the future and be like, this is what you need to know. Or, or past self. Well, no future would be the future way I would self? ask that. Yeah. Oh my God, who the fuck knows where I'm going to be in five years? Um, well, where, where do you want to be? What are your main, main things? If you could uh, pick three things about your life uh, in five years, curated, what would they be? I fucking want to be an established artist and I want to be hopefully supporting artists or even uh-huh. having my own tours. Um, I think I would just tell myself, period. <laughs> period. I don't, I don't know what I would tell myself because like, I, I don't know, like, it would it, like so much probably changed by then. So I don't know. I think I would just be like, keep doing your thing, girl. Keep doing your thing, keep girl. Keep doing your thing, girl. Period. G Lene. G Lene. Thank you, gang. Dante. Appreciate you. Yeah, thank you for having me. You're welcome. I'm excited for your EP. Thank you. Very, very excited. Thank big you for fan, having me on the show. Big friend. You are very, very welcome. <laughs> big, friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. big fan. Big friend. G Lene. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. You want to tell them where they can find your music, where they can. Stream your upcoming EP where they can follow you on the gram. You can follow me at Gloonbaby, G L U N E B A B Y, on Instagram and on Twitter and on TikTok. And I am on all streaming platforms, G space L U N E with a little mark on the top. Thank you. What's the little mark called? 
Oh my god, I literally forgot. That's really embarrassing. <laughs> That's really embarrassing. I'm not. I, oh my god, <laughs> I think it's an accent mark. Um, like a semicolon? No, it's no, not. A semicolon. <laughs> <laughs> it's an exclamation. <laughs> <laughs> it's a question mark. <laughs> Gloon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is Gloon, not Gloon. I mean, honestly, call me whatever the fuck you want. Has anyone really called you Gloon? Yeah, people have called me Gloon, Glooney. Glooney? Uh, <laughs> Glooney. Yeah, Glooney. Glooney, George Clooney? Glo- yeah, George Glooney. <laughs> End of this new artist I found on TikTok. Gloon. Glooney. <laughs> All yeah. Right. All right, Gabby, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Music matters. Music matters.